I go back and I think about songs. There's a song that I learned as a child called God Can. Yeah, I can't calm the raging sea. God can. Can't make honey like a bee. God can. And it goes on and on and on and on. And uh, that instilled in me the little thought. God can. Amen. Amen. We ought to be thankful for those that work with our children. They work tirelessly. They work hard. Uh, they work in conditions that are not very favorable. Uh, I was having a talk with Brother Dean and uh, Brother Brewer the other day, and we were meeting, and, and uh, we were just talking about things and how that there is no air conditioning over in this department, over in that area, whatever you want to call it, department, warehouse, I don't know, and uh, how that if our adults had to meet over there, one Sunday may not do it, but if you met over there, uh, you know, maybe maybe it'd take a month, maybe, maybe a month, maybe four Sundays. I tell you what, we'd probably have those Sunday school classes and that children's church built. Amen. Yeah, I think that if, because we adults, we sit in air conditioning every Sunday. Our teenagers sit in air conditioning every Sunday, they go up to air-conditioned classrooms and, and uh, our children's department, those that's in the bus ministry and things like that, they're over there in the heat. And I think that if we flip, just switch places, we'd see the importance of getting phase two built. Amen. But anyway, that's just a conversation that we were having. Amen. I want to ask you to open up your Bibles tonight. I appreciate the singing. I appreciate uh, the selection of the songs. I believe that it was of the Holy Spirit. And uh, because even that little kid song that Miss Diane sang, when she started singing that song, gave us the title of that song, um, it, it let me know that, that I was right on track with what the Lord was wanting me to preach tonight. I'm going to ask you to turn to Numbers, Numbers chapter number 13, Numbers chapter 13, and we'll begin reading tonight with verse number 1, Numbers chapter 13 and verse 1. I know that we have scheduled tonight a business meeting. Not to, whoa, I'll, I'll try not to be uh, wordy. I don't want to waste words. But one of the best ways to help me preach and move on to the next point is for you all to stay awake and say amen and, and move right along with me. In Numbers chapter 13, verse 1, the Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers shall ye send a man, every one a ruler among them. Now for sake of time, let's go down to verse number 17. And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said unto them, Get you up this way southward and go up into the mountain and see the land, what it is. And the people that dwelleth therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many. Then I want you to go ahead and turn over to verse number 25 in the same chapter. And they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and shewed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came unto the land whether thou sentest us and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great, and moreover we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before 
Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature, all of them. (laughs) And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and look at this, And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. Tonight I want to preach to you on this thought. And think about it. Listen very carefully. Grab a hold of this. I think it's really important. Who are you comparing to your giants? Who are you comparing to? To your giants. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I ask that you will enable me, anoint me, and make me the preacher that you want me to be. I ask you to forgive me of my sins, and I ask you to fill me with your Holy Ghost. Please help me tonight to say exactly what you want said, the way you want it said. In Jesus' name and for his sake, I pray. Amen, and you may be seated. It's good to see Brother Rick Clue here tonight. For those who didn't know, he uh, wrecked his uh, dump truck this week and uh, suffered uh, some damage to his body and maybe maybe more to his body than to his truck. We don't know yet, but uh, uh, he's thinking, no, preacher, the truck looks pretty bad. I just saw his eyes. And so uh, you pray for him. Pray that the insurance company will do the right thing about that truck but pray that he'll recover. Amen. When we look here in this passage of Scripture, I want to point out these little words. In our own sight as grasshoppers. We were in our own sight as grasshoppers. The problem that the Israelites had is when they went into the land of promise, when they saw what they saw, they saw giants. But the problem is, is they compared themselves to the giants. And they saw themselves as grasshoppers. The way you view yourself will determine a great deal of what is accomplished in your own life. If you view yourself smaller always, if you view yourself less always, if you view yourself as being incapable, incompetent, unable, without power, if you constantly view yourself as a grasshopper, you will never ever possess the land that God has for you. I want to talk to you about that tonight. When we look here in this passage of Scripture, I find it very interesting, and this is all introduction, but I find it very interesting, verses 1 and 2. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. I'll let somebody take care of that phone, and we'll move on. Okay. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Have you ever wondered why the Lord wanted them to send in spies? Do you think that quite possibly God knew what they would find? Why send in spies? Why not just bring them up to the land of Canaan? Now, mind you, friend, they've been brought out of the land of Egypt, right? 
They've crossed the Red Sea, right? They've been delivered by God on several occasions. God has came through for them in many, many ways. And now they're getting ready to possess the land that they have been promised. They are on the verge. I know I emphasize this every time I preach about the nation of Israel. I emphasize this point. They were on the verge of entering into a different land. Experiencing the blessings of God. God desired to bring them out of Egyptian bondage. He did. God desired to bring them to the land of promise, and he did. Listen, folks, you are wrong if you think God does not want to bless you. God don't want to bless me. Where are you getting that? Where's the evidence? He gave his son so that you would not go to hell. He he has delivered you from the the bondage of sin. But we are so much like the children of Israel. We so much want to go back to Egypt and eat what they was giving us. And God's saying, oh, sure, you you were fed in Egypt, but I want to give you so much more. And here they are getting ready to go in. God could have came to Moses, and God could have said to Moses, just go and take it. I want the people to stand up. I want the children to stand up. I want them to march in this order. He could have done anything, anything that we can imagine. God could have given him those kind of instructions, but he didn't. He said, here's what I want you to do first. I want you to go spy out the land. So when they went to spy out the land, they saw the good. They could not deny this is a land that flows with milk and honey. If you look there, it talks about the grapes were so plenteous and so big, they had to be carried on a pole between two grown men. That's a huge thing of grapes. But here's the thing. They also saw the giants. They also saw the giants. God wanted them to see the giants. See, some of us tonight, we, here's the way we want our lives to be. Here's the way most people want their lives to be. They want it to be giant free. They want it to be worry free. And so here's what they do. They always avoid the giants. They always avoid the tough decisions. They always avoid climbing the mountain. They always avoid the conflict. They always, avoid, they always avoid taking a step that's going to require God to do something big. So churches are are mediocre. Christians are mediocre. Men have mediocre ministries. People, uh, the way we approach ministry, the way we approach our Sunday school classes, the way we approach the bus ministry, the way we approach the growth of Greater Heights Baptist Church, many times it's mundane, it's mediocre, we're satisfied. We really do not want to be pushed or challenged. Don't challenge me. Who are you to challenge me? Hello, y'all with me tonight? See, ladies and gentlemen, when God sent them in, point number one, why does God make giants? Why in the world, who do you think made Anak? Who was the creator of Anak? I'm trying to preach a message that's going to change your life and y'all are dying on me tonight. Who made Anak? God. Who brought into existence the sons of Anak, the giants? God. God is the makers of giants. God is the God made Goliath. Are you listening? Ladies and gentlemen, here's what we need to grab a hold of. Not only did God, does God make the giants, but God wants us to see the giants. Spy out the land. See how big they are. They are big, and in all appearance, they're big, and they are bad. What are we going to do about the giants, though? Well, here's the problem. We compare ourselves to the giant rather than comparing our God to the giant I know it's remedial I know it's elementary 
But that is at the core of our lack. It's not that we, it's, it, it's just like, well, I, I don't have enough faith. I don't, you know, no, no. The problem is, friend, you are comparing yourself to your giant. What is your giant? It may be a stronghold of sin. It may be something that's had a hold in your life. You, maybe you have a problem telling the truth. Maybe you have a problem with pornography. Maybe you have a problem with all kinds of things. I don't know. Maybe you've got just a problem with fear. You are a fearful person. And I'm always going to be this way. See, here's the thing. The reason that people stay the way they are is because they adopt this mentality, I'm always going to be this way. That's why you stay the way you are. But God did not save you for you to stay the way you are. You were filled with fear before God met you, and God is desiring to deliver you from the feeling of fear. He saved your soul, redeemed you from hell, and is disgusted with us constantly living in fear. He wants us to overcome fear. He has not given us the spirit of fear, but we've adopted this idea. This is just the way we are. And we've got this giant in our life. And we compare ourselves to that giant. And every time we do, we're like a grasshopper. And what in the world can a grasshopper do about a giant? Well, we know what giants do to grasshoppers. They squash them without even seeing them. Who are you comparing to your giant? Some people never advance. They never advance in their career. They get educated. Are you hearing me tonight? They get educated. God, they go down and they ask God and they pray for a job. God blesses them with a job. But when they get into that job, you know what they do? They see the giants. And you know what they never do? They never advance. I don't mean this to sound mean. Please understand what I'm saying. But they, they never see them as manager. They never see themselves running the place. They never see themselves owning their own place. And but here's what they do. They, 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 here's here's what happens. I'm I'm getting ugly tonight, ain't I? I'm getting I'm just just getting right under everybody's skin tonight. They get in this attitude and they get in this spirit of, well, you know what? I'm just I'm just going to be this way, and I'm going to I'm going to humble and be. You know what I'm saying? I'm just going to be this way, and that's going to make me a better Christian. I'm a better Christian. Now my boss is a Christian too. Why? Because I asked God to make me, give me a job with a Christian boss. And my boss is a Christian too, but I'm a better Christian than him. Why? Because I'm not the boss. I will, we'll go nowhere. I'll park here all night long. You want to know why? You want to know why? Here's why. We ask God for jobs. We ask God for these positions. We get those positions, and then you know what happens? We see ourselves as grasshoppers because of the giants that exist. And so we go ahead and let them be the giant, and we go ahead and remain the grasshopper. Now, wait a minute. It was God who gave us the job. It was God that provided for the education. Right? We praised God for the degree. Am I listening to me tonight? Well, why can't the same God that's helped us this far, why can't the same God that's brought us up to the promised land, the land that flows with milk and honey, the land of promise, the land of blessing, the God that's brought us up to the land of blessing, why is it that we, we choose time and time again to remain as grasshoppers and miss the blessing and walk away from the experience thinking that we're better Christians for it? There are preachers 
There are preachers that will not go ahead and believe God for more and move forward for God in the ministry. And here's the reason why. They go ahead and they look at the ministry and they think, oh my goodness, what would that require? I can't do that. You know what happens? Hundreds of people in their community die and go to hell over time. Because pre- preachers didn't believe God for more. Am I, am I, have I gotten, have I, am I being too straight tonight? It's the truth. Amen. Gang, all of those people that were 20 and up, I think it was the age that was set for them. I may have the age wrong. My mind just went blank. But all of that generation never tasted one grape, never drank the milk one time, never took their finger and licked up the honey one time. They never tasted the honey. They never drank the milk. They never ate the grapes. They never experienced the, 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 the incredible blessings of God that God wanted from them or wanted for them that he promised to them when he led them out of the land of Egypt on their way out. He, they, they never tasted any of those blessings. You want to know why? Because how they viewed themselves, how they compared themselves to the giants rather than comparing their God to the giants. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the first point is this. Why does God make giants? The answer, I believe, is this. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse number uh, yeah, uh, verse 27. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 27, look at this. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. God uses those things that are weak. God doesn't use, uh, God doesn't, you, you look in the Bible. God doesn't use giants to slay giants. He used boys with slings to slay giants. God, hey, listen, listen, God didn't raise up another giant. You don't find that there was a giant born to the nation of Israel that went out and fought Goliath. No, God said, there's a giant and here's a boy. Friend, if you're waiting on God to make you a giant, to face your giants, you're going to be waiting a long time. I'm going to say this in love. There are some folks that stay in training too long. You've been training to do something for God too long. It's time to do something for God. That's good preaching. You've been going to Sunday school too long. Now it's time to be a Sunday school teacher. What have you been going to Sunday school for? To be trained to be a Sunday school teacher. I can't do it. Why? Who says you can't? Well, I don't know this, I don't know this. That idea of being a Sunday school teacher is a giant in my life. Well, who are you comparing to that giant? The God that saved you and got you in Sunday school class? Are you? I agree with you. You're a grasshopper. So am I. So am I. And the world even looks at us as though we're grasshoppers. But God uses grasshoppers. See, ladies and gentlemen, when, this child, when these children of Israel got through wandering in the wilderness for the next 40 years and all those people died and the next generation is raised up, you don't find that giants went and slayed the giants in Canaan. It was the children of those that compared themselves. You know what happened? The children of grasshoppers took the land. Baby grasshoppers took the land. Amen. God uses small things. God uses inadequate people. God uses men like Moses who are slow in speech for them to lead millions of people 
The man who says that I can't is the man that God is looking for, but that man will never experience what God has for him if he doesn't quit comparing himself to the giants. you got to start comparing your God to your giants. Everything that I mentioned before, fear can be overcome. Inferiority complexes can be overcome. Sins, strongholds of sin can be overcome. You can be a different person than you ever thought you could be. The Bible still says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. You can. When you start getting that spirit of the, the spirit of I grew up I, I grew up in a house where I was constantly told you can't do that. And I don't mean sin. I'm not talking about I wanted to go out and sin. They said you can't do that. No, it's just I I, I want to be on the, the team. Well, you can't be on the team. You can't do that. I want to be class president. You can't do that. And I'm here to tell you, friend, that you, if you grow up in, an, in a you-can't atmosphere where you can't do that, you can't be that, eventually you will either get real ornery about it and say, oh, yes, I can, or you'll succumb to it. And I'm convinced that there's one thing that people like to share. It's the negative you had 10 spies that came back saying the negative and two spies saying, let's go take it right now. Let's do it right now. And for some reason, they listened to the negative instead of the positive, even though the positive was much more adamant than the negative. We, we are prone. Is the of Adamic nature. We are prone. Our ears are bent to we can't rather than perked up to, oh, yes, we can Are you hearing me? And why it's that way, I'm not sure. I know it. I know why it's that way in my own life. I know why. But I don't know how it was for you growing up. But I'm here to tell you, once you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, the rules change. Everything changes once you get saved. The Lord changes everything, which brings me to point number two. Go back to Numbers chapter 14. Folks, I am preaching so hard tonight, not because I'm angry at you. I am trying my best to break through a mentality that is holding captive many members of Greater Heights Baptist Church. Amen. I've got a giant in front of me tonight. What am I going to do? Well, let's just go on and be how we are. I'm going to say it. I love you too much for that. I do. No, it's time by the grace of God to overcome some of those giants. Point number two. Point number one is why does God make giants? God makes giants so that he can overcome them. And get glory in the week. Number two, what brings a Caleb spirit? See, look at verses 7 through 10. Verse, chapter 14 of Numbers 7. And they spake unto all the co company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. This is Caleb. See, there's some people that, that, that had came back and because Caleb and, and uh, uh, Joshua were so adamant that it was so good, they stood up and said, well, the land that we came through eateth up the people. They're saying, it's, it's hard work. It's a, bad, it's a bad place. In other words, they're saying the promised land isn't as good as God promised. They get back up again and say it is. It's a, an exceeding good land. Verse 8, and if the Lord, look at this, if the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Verse number 9, only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land. How do we start this story off? 
Chapter 13, verse number 2. Send thou men that they may search the land which I give unto the children of Israel. I have already given it to you. It's already there. It's just yours to possess. All you got to do is go and look. Are you still with me? Amen. They're saying over here, rebel not ye against the Lord. You want to know what I believe is at the core? This is what God dealt with me about on my own level, on me personally, and maybe, maybe you. You want to know what I believe is at the core of not dealing with the giants? A rebel heart. Well, I'm not a rebel. Are you facing the giant? Are you dealing with the giants? Did God not tell you to go and possess the land? Turn with me to Romans chapter number 12. Romans chapter 12. Verse number 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Verse number 2, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. Are you experiencing a transformation? Are you, have you been transformed? Are you, if you were something and now you're something else? See, those of us that have been raised in church all of our lives, we do not have the stories that we were alcoholics. We do not have the stories that we were dope smokers. We, we do not have the stories that we were whoremongers, do we? But do you realize that we have just as many giants in us? The giant of pride. The very fact that we like to say, well, I've never drank, I've never smoked. Why do you like saying that? Whoop-de-doo. Big deal. So what? My lands. Okay, you didn't drink. Hallelujah. You didn't drink. But you still won't face the giants you got. Okay, you didn't smoke. You never smoked a cigarette. Oh, great. But you still won't face the giant. You still don't have enough faith to tithe. Hello? See, we do have giants, even those of us that have never, and we're not dealing with those things. We're dealing with things. But the problem is we're not really dealing with things. That's good preaching. What brings this Caleb spirit? He says, don't rebel against the Lord. We are supposed to be being trans. If you, if you got saved, you are in a transformation process. And if you are not in a transformation process, I'm convinced you've never got saved. Well, I haven't changed one lick. There's some, well, I, I, I agree, but gang, you need to understand something. Jesus changes people, and he came, he came to those that needed transformation, not to those that didn't need transforming. Look at Luke 5, 32. Bring it up on the screen before I go any further. I says, it says this, I came not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. Have you ever repented of anything? Have you ever had the spirit of repentance? Well, I, I haven't, preacher. You're not saved, friend. You're here on a Sunday night and not saved. You're here tonight. You've never drank. You've never smoked. You've never ran with the whoremongers. You've never done all those things that all those bad people did. You've never done any of those things. But guess what? If you've never repented... Jesus came for folk to folks. I never done any of those things. But I have repented. The day I got saved, there was a spirit of repentance. See, friend, 
in Romans 12 too. I'm trying to get to this point and I'm, I'm trying to let it sink in. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. There are folks that attend churches all across this county and all across the world. You know what? <laughs> they are not, they, they I got to say it. <coughs> they still love what the world loves. They still think like the world thinks. But they think because they don't drink, don't smoke, and are not whoremongers, they think everything's okay. You hearing me? See, friend, there are people who go to church every day that the doors are open, but if you really get down to it, they're still trusting the almighty dollar just as much as the lost man out there. They still think the most important thing on this planet is money. They really think that, Brother Paul. In the, in the core of their being, if you really got down to the nitty-gritty of what they're really thinking is going to make them happy, what they're really trusting to get them through, they're still trusting the almighty dollar. Amen. That's just like the world. We're supposed to be transformed from that. How do we get transformed? Let's get on with the point, right? How do we get transformed? By the renewing of your mind, the renovating of your mind. But friend, the simplest definition of repentance is to have a change of mind, a change of direction. Your mind had you going one direction and you have a repentance and you repent from that direction and you change your mind and you go the way the Lord leads you, right? You know you cannot have a renewed mind if you've not already experienced a repentant mind. No. No. You want to know why some people cannot get a grasp on this renewing of their mind? It's because they've never repented. They've never had a change of mind. You know, there are people in this world that when you start talking about repentance and they start getting under conviction, they'll start thinking this way. Well, you, well to be honest with you, preacher, I didn't really have anything to repent of. I, I went forward when I was, and I'm not saying you didn't get saved. I'm just telling you the way I used to think. When somebody would preach this way, here's what I would do, Brother Stephen. I'd sit back there and I would think, well, my goodness, I went forward when I was six years old. I hadn't really done anything bad yet. What I was doing to myself was identifying, you know, I've never really repented. And the reason I didn't repent when I was six is because I didn't see the need. Anybody hearing me? And one of the things that's real hard to do, gang, it's really hard to have a, the mind of God. It's really hard to have the renewing of your mind. It's really hard to experience the transforming power of the resurrection if you've never had a moment of repentance. You want to know what's stopping you from facing those giants one or two things, you've never really dealt with the rebel heart or you're fearing the giants. So where'd you get that from? Go back to Numbers. Numbers chapter 14. In Numbers chapter 14, verse number 9, only rebel not ye against the Lord. That's what's wrong. That's at the core I can't experience the problem. I can't, keep, I can't go forward for God. Well, the fact may be you've never really repented and had a changing of mind. That's why you can't have a renewing of your mind. You can't be transformed. You're not a giant slayer. 
The reason you're not a giant slayer is because they're still a rebel. Or you fear the people of the land. One or two. It's either a rebellious spirit or the spirit of fear. Am I, am I making sense? God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love and of a sound mind. Amen. If you'll get that rebel thing settled, and if that rebel thing is settled, you're sitting here tonight and you can say, Preacher, you know what I did? I did repent. I have experienced repentance in my life. Well, then the next step you need to take is you need to go ahead and accept that God is really trying to change your mind about what? Whatever it needs to be changed about. We need to start viewing giants differently. What brings a Caleb spirit? Caleb was real concerned that the children of Israel not have a rebel spirit. You want to know what brings a Caleb spirit? The absence of a rebel spirit. Don't rebel. What brings a Caleb spirit? He says, if the Lord will, then he will bring us into this land. If the Lord delight in us, verse number 8. Ladies and gentlemen, once you get rid of the rebel spirit, there's a change, a transformation starts taking place to where you want the Lord to delight in you. In other words, if God decides to delight in us, if God decides to favor us, we can have this land. We can have the blessings of God. And it is so heartbreaking, it's so angry, aggravating, and frustrating. I get so aggravated with myself. And when this idea, this, this thing creeps up in me or in my home, this idea of God's against us. God wants to bless us. Last but not least, why does God make giants? Number two, what brings a Caleb spirit? See, if you'll look at verse number 23 and 24 of Numbers 14, the Lord says, all these people are going to die. Verse 23 says, Surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him. And hath followed me fully. Him will I bring into the land whereinto he went and his seed shall possess it. You know the story. As an 80-year-old man, he takes that mountain that God promised him. Point number three. Let's go to the book of Colossians. We're done. I'm going to read 15 verses in Colossians. Please let the Holy Spirit seep his word in right now. Whisper a prayer. Father in heaven, please, please let me get this. Verse number one of Colossians 3. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify therefore your members, which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil, concupiscence and covetousness which is idolatry for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them but now ye also put off all these things anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image 
of him that created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, longsuffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let, look at verse number 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. What do we do with these giants? Who are you comparing to your giants? What we have got to do, gang, is we have got to let peace, the peace of God, overrule the spirit of fear. If we're not rebels, which I'm trusting that most of us are not, I'm trusting that that's not the issue. I'm trusting that we've accepted Christ and we've had that spirit of repentance. Well, then what is the other thing? We fear the giants. We've got to let the peace of God overrule the fear. We've got to let the peace of God have reign in our hearts. If we would just allow this to happen. There's a young fellow on Jacob's football team. He's one of the smaller guys. Seems to always be that way. I would give you his name, but that, that, that may not be right for me to do that. And, but he's a little fella. But I'm telling you what, he plays like a big guy. My wife's nodding her head. We were talking about it at the football game Saturday. Sometimes I would love to be able to put the heart of the little guy in the big guy. Because the big guys on the team, they got some giants on Jacob's team. But they don't have the heart of that little guy. They are afraid to hit. They're afraid to hit the big guys. I have on occasion seen some of the bigger boys see a giant running the football, and they have almost tackled him like, you know, like this. You know, let him run by and grab him by the shirt on his way by. Ole tackling is what we used to call it. Ole. But not this little guy. I mean, I'm telling you what. He sacked the quarterback, was it four times Saturday? I'm talking about a little guy. I mean, he's little, little. Sacked the quarterback at, at least four times. Caused a couple of fumbles. Hitting guys. Getting in a fight on the other sidelines. Something happened. We couldn't tell what was happening. He hit somebody on the other sidelines, and people are jailing and fussing. And here you see this little guy. And the guy was, at, I'm no joking, close to two feet taller than this guy. And he's trying to get in his face. And I'm not saying he ought to, ought to be that way, but I don't know that boy. I don't know what that boy. That boy may have done something to him, and, and you know, and this, that, that's football. I, I, I wonder, I wonder what makes him have that spirit. I wonder why, oh, what, does he not, does he not really see just how big and how much bigger those guys are than him. It's almost as if he doesn't even realize he's as little as he is. He's got a different spirit about him. It is. He's just got a different spirit about him. When he's out there on the field, I've, not, I've never seen him do Ole. We've seen some big boys run around his side, and I've never seen him let him go. They run over him. But they know he was there. <laughs> you say, well, let me ask you this. 
wouldn't you like to taste the grapes? Wouldn't you like to take a drink of that milk? Wouldn't it be really good to dip your finger in that honey and experience those promises that God has made? When you've got to quit comparing yourself to the giants. God wants you to have it. You've got to trust him that he'll give it to you. Would you stand with every head bowed and every eye closed? Father, I pray that you will forgive me of how that I have cowed down so many times to so many giants. I pray that you'll forgive me. I have been afraid.